Hello, this is Jeff Zeig. I'm the founder and the director of the Milton Erickson Foundation. I'm in our offices in Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, telling stories about some of my experiences with Milton Erickson. In this case, some of the stories about Dr. Erickson being therapeutically um, valuable to me, helping me in places where I was stuck. I moved to Phoenix, Arizona in 1978, and I got licensed as a psychologist here. And very early in my career, I got a call from an attorney. And the attorney said that he was referred to me by Dr. Erickson, who said that he was too old and too ill to help. The attorney was representing a young man who was charged with murder. A witness to the crime had been hypnotized by a police investigator. That hypnosis was videotaped. The witness, uh, the purpose of the hypnosis was to refresh the memory of the witness. The attorney for the defendant believed that the hypnosis was done improperly and contaminated the testimony of the witness so that the testimony should no longer be um, included uh, in the court proceedings against the defendant. The attorney said, would I please view the videotape and give a professional opinion about whether or not the hypnosis was done incorrectly. I said, I'm a new psychologist, but I will be glad to give you my unbiased opinion. And my credentials were submitted that I was trained by Milton Erickson, world's foremost authority on hypnosis, and so I was going to be the expert for the defense. Well, meanwhile, the prosecuting attorney calls Dr. Erickson. Dr. Erickson says that he cannot testify because he's too old and too ill, calls Zeig. No, the attorney says that this is an important case and the validity of hypnosis as a forensic tool is being challenged. If Dr. Erickson won't testify, will he please give a deposition that can be read into the court record? An official deposition could be read into the uh, court record. So Dr. Erickson said, okay, the police van came, took him down to the police station where he could view the videotape of the uh, forensic examiner doing hypnosis to refresh the memory of the witness. Now it just so happened that Dr. Erickson was one of the people who was teaching the uh, police department how to use hypnosis for forensic investigations. Well, um, now the sides are even. It's Jeff Zeig for the defense and Milton Erickson for the prosecution. So I uh, kindly, I uh, calmly called him and said, oh, what are you doing? Uh, can I come over and talk with you about this? And he said, of course. So uh, I, I laid out the details and he said, Jeff, you have a few things to learn, don't you? I said, absolutely. Then I thought about it for a minute and I said, you know, Dr. Erickson, I, I've never testified in a courtroom before. The whole setting makes me nervous. I can only imagine that an attorney is attacking me about my perspectives, my credentials, and it scares me. Can you give me some therapy? And Dr. Erickson looks at the floor for a moment and suddenly a story emerges. And this was Dr. Erickson's art, was to be able to use storytelling um, as a context in which therapeutic orientations could be placed so that they could be elicited and activated by the client and um, think in very broad brushstrokes about the metaphor of an injector. The injector is not the medicine. It's just the way in which the medicine is delivered and stories, metaphors, analogies, uh, assignments, tasks, fragments of poetry, fragments of literature, these are all ways to awaken an experiential realization, a conceptual realization. Part of the target for therapy can be to help people to activate concepts. One concept that I needed at the moment was to be competent at being able to be an expert. So Dr. Erickson's story was about a previous case in which he was involved with, where he was testifying for the husband who would be the best custodial parent for the children. 
Now this was a time when the wife almost always got residential custody of the children, but Dr. Erickson had done a psychiatric examination of the husband, the wife, the children, and was ready to testify that he truly believed in his professional opinion that the husband was the best custodial parent for the children. In a pretrial meeting, he was not given any information about the wife's attorney, so he inferred that the wife's attorney was going to be very challenging and difficult. Let's assume that it was a female attorney. And in the day uh, in court, Dr. Erickson's on the witness stand, and the attorney has 13 pages of typewritten questions to impeach Dr. Erickson's testimony. He's sitting in the witness stand, she's challenging him. She says, Dr. Erickson, you say that you're an expert in psychiatry. Who is your authority? Dr. Erickson says, well, I am my authority. Because he knows that if he would cite Freud or Jung, she would say, aren't those theories speculative and start to undermine his testimony? She says, Dr. Erickson, you say that you're an expert in psychiatry. What is psychiatry? And Dr. Erickson says, calmly, I can give you an example. If I were an expert on American history, I would know something about Simon Gertie, also called Dirty Gertie. Because anyone who is an expert on American history would know about Simon Gertie, also called Dirty Gertie. And every expert on American history should know about Simon Gertie, also called Dirty Gertie. Erickson said at that moment he looked up at the judge and the judge had his hands over his face. He said the clerk of the court was on the floor trying to find a pencil and the attorney for his side couldn't suppress an uncontrollable laugh. As Erickson's telling me the story, he's laughing, he's living the story. I'm laughing because Dr. Erickson is laughing. And this is the advice that he gave me about my nervousness about being challenged in a courtroom. Now suddenly I had to shift my brain into a higher gear and to understand what is the personal meaning that this can have to me. Well, for one thing, Dr. Erickson was using an embedded command. The name of the, uh, of the aggressive attorney was Gertie. And Erickson was talking about Simon Gertie, who was actually a traitor during the American Revolution. And as he said, Simon Gertie, whose nickname was Dirty Gertie, he was Dirty Gertie. And the, uh, this was his way of confronting the unnecessary aggressiveness of the attorney who was challenging him. Dr. Erickson was indicating to me, Jeff, you have a resource in your own history, some uh, anecdote that you can use that will help you. He was indicating to me, Jeff, you don't have to be intimidated by the situation, that, that you can be adequate in dealing with the situation. Now, if he would have said those things to me directly, Jeff, you can use a resource, you can use any of the techniques you've learned from me, you have um, ways of being able to cope adequately with challenging situations. I would have wrote them down, written them down in a notebook and I wouldn't have had a, a story to uh, tell 40 years later. But when he gift wrapped that in that message and he was laughing so hysterically as he was telling the story and I was laughing, what has happened to me is that every time I walk into a courtroom, I have a hallucination. It's like there's a, an image floating in space in front of me and I'm back in Dr. Erickson's living room and he's telling me the story about Dirty Gertie and he's laughing hysterically. And I, I see the courtroom because it's a hallucination, but I feel the laughter because also uh, it's a vivid memory to me. And suddenly I'm in a different orientation. I'm conceptually in a different place. My identity is different as I enter the courtroom. Every time I enter a courtroom, I am infused with the spirit of the story of Dirty Gertie. And uh, this was a way in which Erickson traditionally conducted therapy, that therapy can be considered the reorganization of internal life that the components are there and that the job of the therapy, the job of the story in this case, is to elicit those components, bring them together so that the person, in this case me, could realize a different orientation. Again, Dr. Erickson never asked me 
what happened. And the outcome of the case? Well, there was a plea, so neither Dr. Erickson or I ever did testify in court about that. And uh, when I talked with Dr. Erickson about the hypnosis afterwards, when we could have a discussion about it, he said that really no hypnosis had happened, that the police investigator's technique was so stiff, so rigid, so formalized, it was as if the police investigator was just reading out of, uh, out of a, uh, a script and uh, that in the interaction effect wasn't there. The client wasn't really that much affected by the hypnosis. At the time, I didn't have that perspective to see it, but certainly I agreed that the witness's testimony was not tarnished by the hypnosis. This is Jeff Zeig. Here I am in Phoenix, Arizona. Stories about Milton Erickson.